Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E1. Uh, this is lecture two, Hardware Continued. And it seems uh, it's, it's pretty fitting that we get to talk today a bit more about hardware, um, because just this past week, Apple announced some new hardware uh, that uh, I want to show you a video about, actually, right now. So enjoy. When a product comes along that appears so stupid that the ways that you can make fun of it are practically endless, it actually becomes magical. I mean, as comedy writers, the range of jokes that we can make about the iPad is as wide as the useless piece of shit itself. The iPad's absurd and unwieldy size makes it a nothing short of a revolution in parody inspiration. Do we, do we call it the iPod Jumbo? Do we create a sketch using an iPhone calling it the iPad Nano where we suggest that the smaller one can actually make phone calls? I mean, the options are limitless. I don't have to write jokes about the iPad. The iPad practically makes jokes about itself. It, it's superb. Now, the name iPad brings to mind feminine hygiene products. And this is something we're really excited about. Maxi pads, tampons, you know, menstrual goods of all kinds. We could also make puns, like calling it the I pay too much, or just saying that this is what people in Boston have been calling iPods for years. See, these, these jokes come so naturally, you, you don't even have to think about it. You just mock. Uh, if you want to go with the idea that this thing makes Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos try to commit suicide, you can. Uh, if you want to pull a 180 and say, sure, I love reading books on a bright LED screen that hurts my eyes because I f***ing hate myself, you can do that too. It's two completely opposite approaches that are both valid. It's, it's just a pleasure. It is the most obviously useless piece of technology we've seen around here in a long time, maybe ever, but certainly in my time uh, here at College Humor. The ultimate uses, they just come to you as if in a dream, you know? There's a saucer, dinner plate, frying pan, frisbee. I mean, it's endless. I think, I, I truly believe we're entering a new comedy world rush. Now, we decided on the meta approach because, you know, we've learned so much from our other parodies of Apple products that we really felt that we could Take a whole new, revolutionary, magical, phantasmagorical-icious, expialidocious approach to this big, easy target. I mean, it's almost like the iPad has a big kick-me sign on its back. Quite simply, this little retard TV is going to change the way that we make fun of Apple. Now, this is pretty funny, because if you actually go to um, Apple's website and... Okay, and you actually go to Apple's website, they have this really long intro video about this device that they just released, and they're always using all these extreme adjectives to describe it. Magical, wondrous, awesome, really great, all of these sorts of things, and after a while, like it, it looks kind of neat, but after a while you, it, you realize that there's also a lot of hype behind it as well. And uh, it's, it's pretty interesting, I think, that, uh, that they released this because it's, it's one of these things that it's, it's sort of a technology that we haven't really seen before. Maybe it's a logical evolution rather than a revolution in technology in terms of, the, of what we currently have available today um, because many people are comparing it to basically just an oversized iPhone and maybe that's, that's all it will amount to. It remains to be seen. Um, but it, in the end, this is still basically a computer at heart. And so it is what it is, and it's small, it's relatively thin, but it can do things now in 2010 that we frankly were just not able to comprehend um, even just a few years ago. It just seems so futuristic and so far off in terms of what it was able to do. And, and you know, at the fundamental level, this still does the same sorts of things that we were talking about last week. In order for it to do its computation, it has a CPU inside of it, and this CPU calculates and does stuff based on the binary language of zeros and ones. So you're going to get one? I, I, I tried as long as I could to not get the iPhone. I did everything. I was like, oh, this iPhone's a piece of junk. I'm never going to get it. And then I caved months later. So I'm, I also just say, yeah, probably. <laughs> Yeah, so don't, don't think we're being too harsh on this because, um, in fact, uh, people tend to be very harsh on Apple anytime they release something new these days. Expectations are sort of over here. And frankly, I don't know what people were expecting that they're now uh, so blatantly disappointed with this. But I was fascinated and also reassured uh, in terms of my stock portfolio when a friend of mine actually forwarded me this link. Do you mind toggling over for a second? The date of this bulletin board is October 23rd, 2001. And if you uh, thought people have been a bit harsh on the iPad now, I thought I would read some excerpts from when the iPod itself first came out. So 
Uh, this is perhaps choice. I, I, I poop, I cry, I was hoping for something more. Great, just what the world needs, another freaking MP3 player. Uh, let's scroll down here to, I can't believe, I still can't believe this. All this hype for something so ridiculous. Who cares about an MP3 player? I want something new. I want them to think differently. Why, oh, why would they do this? It's so wrong. It's so stupid. So frankly, I dare say we heard, what, nine years ago, the same kind of rhetoric people were uh, blathering on the, the interwebs now. Um, so it'll be, be interesting, uh, needless to say, in a few months to see just what this and the future brings. So. That's right. Um, so last week, uh, we were talking a bit about um, binary and, uh, and how we were able to represent also um, characters with this, with this binary representation or with zeros and ones. And we actually have a, uh, a small demo that, uh, that we wanted to show last week but couldn't. And so we're going to try to, to do it now. So we need eight volunteers, believe it or not, for this. So this is your moment of awkwardness at the start of the semester. Do we have eight people brave enough to, one, stand here? Uh, you don't have to say anything. You just have to stand here a bit awkwardly. But you do have to be comfortable uh, appearing on camera. So that's the one gotcha. Yeah, two, come on down. Six more. Three, four, five, six, seven, one more. Eight, come on down. All right. So as a little uh, quiz first, let's, uh, the goal is for each of you to stand in front of your classmates here holding a piece of paper. I'm going to give each of you one piece of paper, keep the big bold number in front of you facing your classmates, and I will leave it to you to sort yourself. So a little bit of a quiz here for you all, and then we'll challenge the audience here. So please arrange yourselves as you should. Um, we'll fix in a sec. <laughs> All right, and finally, so you'll recall that one of the topics last week, okay, ready, arrange. One of the topics last week was, if you're not sure what you're doing, look to the person to the left or the right, perhaps. One of the topics last week was the whole binary system, binary being, meaning by, for two, so the language that computers actually speak. Oh, Oma. Perfect, yeah, yep, oh, excellent, so good. Excellent. So this is a bit of a recap of a byte, a bit. So each of these humans, each of these classmates represents a placeholder. We have the ones place down here, the 128s place over here. And recall that using 8 bits can you express not just numbers, but also alphabetical letters. Using what code, what scheme? Yeah, ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, -I, which was just a mapping from letters to numbers, numbers to letters. And even if you don't remember almost all of them, what was one key value that's easy to remember? 65 was the letter A, and we can pretty much reverse engineer everything from there. So we've gone ahead and prefabbed a little bit of a, a riddle for you all, uh, a three-letter word that these folks are going to spell out. On the backs of their sheets of paper are three steps. One, two, three. They're going to do each of these steps in turn. And what I'm going to ask you eight to do is if you are told to represent a one, just put a hand up to make it clear that you're a one. And if you're a zero, just stand there awkwardly. All right, so ready? Round one. Here, try lifting up your papers. How about doing that? That'll make it more obvious. Yeah. There you go. So now we got to make well, now, okay. <laughs> okay. Never mind. So what do we have? We have someone. What number is being represented at the moment? Audience, please. We have A64, but a somewhat shy gentleman over in the <laughs> tooth place. So 60. So 66. Okay, so the number 66 is currently encoded by this byte, which means they are representing the letter. B. All right, so you were a capital B. All right, hands down. Excellent. Round two of three. Go. Can someone second that? 79. We got a 64 over here. An 8, so that's 72 plus 4 plus dot, 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 79. Yay, nay. OK, 79. So what are they representing? O, so we have B-O in the big finale. Bring it home, round three, if you would. Don't shout out just yet. Give a few people a chance to do the math. And what do you got? I see some murmurs of 87, in which case they are representing the letter. W, which means they've just spelled. Bow. So if you would take your bow, congratulations. Thank you very much. A round of applause for our volunteers here. And if you don't mind, 
Uh, the internet and the lawyers require that we just get your signature on these pieces of paper. So consider this a nice little parting gift. You can bring it back to your chairs. We'll get it during the break. So uh, to summarize, last week we looked at the very basic building blocks of computing, which ultimately reduces to either some electricity, storing ones and zeros as electronic signals flowing or not flowing, or even magnetic particles on things like hard drives and floppies doing the same, albeit in a different manner. So that was week one. So you might remember that we have this device in a computer, and it's sort of the main, the the brain, the main brain, so to speak, of this computer. And it actually is what does the computing. What is this device that we have? The, I know you, know you know the answer. This is not a hard question. Not a trick question, I promise. OK, I'll say it myself, the CPU. So we have the CPU sort of in the center of the computer. And its main goal, is, and this is just a reminder of some of the material that we went over last week, is to be able to process this information. So we might get some input. So uh, we have a variety of, of what are called input and output devices. And you'll hear this term sometimes. Um, input and output is used collectively sometimes in a term known as I slash O. I O just, is just uh, really an abbreviation for this term input output. So we can sometimes input information into the computer by a variety of means, like the keyboard, for example, or the mouse, or maybe some other device like a scanner or digital camera. Any method that we can actually input information into the computer, then usually the computer has to do something with it, which is where it goes to the, this data goes to the CPU, whatever is being done to this data is being processed in it, and then it is output to us uh, through a variety of means as well. So what might be, you might be able to guess, what are some various output devices that we might have? So this is now something that would be where the computer would show information to us. So not software, because that's usually, that's usually what helps use the CPU to process this input and, and provide this output. But there's these devices, just like we have a physical keyboard and we have a physical mouse, where, that are used as interfaces to allow us to input data. There's also interfaces that allow computers to display data to us. So yeah, so like a monitor, a screen, uh, a printer, uh, sound, so like uh, speakers and, and sound systems, et cetera, all of these are known as, as output devices. And this becomes especially useful when we start talking about peripherals. Um, but in the meantime, that's just a, a big tease to some of the stuff that we have coming up a little bit later. But in the meantime, it's a little bit more complex of a picture than this for the computer to do its processing. As you might recall, we store the majority of our data where? So when the computer is off, it's stored somewhere in the computer. Right, on the hard drive. So we have something that we abbreviate as HDD, just to represent hard disk drive. This is what stores the majority of your data, your programs, your, your photos, your music, all of the things that you actually use on your computer are stored in the hard drive. Now, we also talked about how this is a type of memory. This is a, what's called a non-volatile memory. In other words, it's memory that is not going to get lost. The data is not going to get lost as soon as the power is cut. But there's another type of memory that we have as well, where all of this data is loaded from the hard drive into this type of memory. And that is what is actually used, that, that the CPU actually uses to reference. So what was this third type of uh, block that we have? Right, RAM. You may recall this picture was backwards last week since I'm right-handed and Dan is left-handed. I'm left-handed, yeah, so <laughs> this is the correct way to think about it for the 10% of you that are left-handed. Anyway, so we have this, and uh, if you're right-handed, it's mirrored, but it's basically the same thing. Um, and we said that we have this, this idea of, of hard drives having a lot of data or a lot of capacity. RAM having, nowadays, quite a bit, but not anywhere near as much as modern hard drives. Uh, and, and these caches or even smaller pieces of memory between the RAM and the CPU. So just this sort of funneling of data before it actually gets to the CPU. And what was the purpose of this? Why did we have this sort of pathway? Why don't we just have, why don't we just skip all these middlemen and just have the hard drive and the CPU? What's the problem? Right, so the, the big problem is that we want to be able to quickly get from memory a lot of the data that we are currently using. 
So sure, you might be able to store a whole bunch of stuff on your hard drive, but you're not going to be using it all at once. You're not going to be playing all of the music files at the same time from your hard drive, for example. You're not going to be viewing all of the photos that are on your hard drive at the same time or using all of the programs. So it seems logical to have this less expensive but slower memory that is a permanent storage where we can store all of our stuff even though it might temporarily not be used. So we load only what we need into RAM, and so whatever is currently being used, your open programs like your web browser, any web pages you have open, um, iTunes or other music software that's playing an MP3 or, or some other type of music file, or maybe iPhoto, for example, or some other photo program where you're actually viewing your photos, all of that stuff, as you're using it, is loaded into RAM. So the more programs that you open, the more RAM you're going to use. Now, we did reference, or we alluded to this uh, very briefly last week, but this is something that's really important, and we should talk about it, because this is perhaps one of the least well understood concepts, I think, but probably also the one thing that will really help you understand why your computer might slow down. As you might imagine, when we load up lots and lots of programs on, on, on a computer, not, not, when I say load, I don't mean install. I'm talking about actually opening them and running them, using them side by side. So maybe, like right now, for example, I have Firefox open, and maybe I switch to mail, for example, and start reading some mail, and then I go back to iTunes, start listening to some music, and I'm just switching between all of these programs. What happens to the contents of RAM? So I have a certain amount of capacity in this RAM, and eventually, as I start loading more data into it, I'm going to run out of RAM. Now, if, I'm, if I don't actually use that much, so maybe I just have a web browser open, for example, then my, my RAM requirements are pretty low. And chances are that whatever RAM my computer actually has, so keep in mind that we said, you know, we, we generally expect something like in the range of one to four gigabytes. This might be a bit generous these days of RAM in a typical computer that you can buy. You might also see, um, especially if a computer is, is uh, less expensive, something as low as, say, 512 megabytes. But if you're getting that low, that's really not enough RAM these days. And, and having this value, knowing this value, lets you know how constrained you will be uh, with the, the programs that you have loaded into your computer. And in fact, on, on just about every computer, you can usually get a graph of some kind that actually tells you how much RAM you're using. So in this case, this is a Mac, and there's something called Activity Monitor, which actually shows me a, a very nice pie graph of what I have loaded into memory. And one of the things that you'll notice are that there's a very, very small sliver of green, and it is this green that represents the free memory that I have on this laptop. Now, it's pretty obvious that this green sliver is very, very small, and, and it's essentially gone. I essentially have no free memory right now on this laptop. Yet things are still working. Things are still running. I'm not getting any sort of out-of-memory errors. Um, it might be a little bit slower, but I'm not seeing something really annoying like, oh, I can't do what you asked me to do because I'm completely out of memory. Now, there's a reason for that, and that is this, this idea that someone came up with called virtual memory. Now, I have a fixed amount of RAM, and this doesn't have quite as much capacity as my hard drive would, and in many cases, it's much smaller in capacity than, than my hard drive. Um, but so what that means is that when I run out of, of RAM, maybe I can use some of the free space that's left on my hard drive as sort of, as sort of a slower version of this RAM uh, that, uh, that I can use at least temporarily. So uh, the computer, and more specifically the operating system, might block off a chunk of the hard drive and reserve it not for your photos, not for your music, not for your applications, but to make this sort of an extension of this RAM. So now every time I load a program, it's going to load it into RAM, quote unquote, and I don't actually know, me being the user, whether it's being loaded into actual physical RAM or into this block of the hard drive that is called virtual memory. And it's virtual because it's not actual real memory in the sense that we would know it, but the computer is just pretending. It's virtualizing that aspect of it. But in this way, I can extend how much RAM I have to be many more gigabytes up to the capacity of my hard drive. So as long as I still have free space on my hard drive, I can keep loading programs up. 
but what might be the downside to this? So remember we said there was a very specific reason that we have a lot of capacity in hard drive and less capacity in RAM. And if we're starting to use hard drive for, this, for the same tasks that we use RAM, what's the downside? That's right, programs are going to bog down and run slower. So let's just uh, pretend for a moment that I have in memory, you know, about um, a quarter of it is going to my web browser, for example. And I have another quarter of it that's going to maybe my mail application. This is definitely not how it would actually be in, in real terms, but um, just to give you an idea of, of what we're, we're talking about here. So maybe the other one, another quarter is for my music player, maybe the other one is for my photo, and then I want to actually do some real legitimate work. So now the computer, even though it's run out of memory, it now allows me to load, say, Microsoft Word into virtual memory. Now, what happens is that the computer always tries to use whatever you are actually using in front and load that into actual RAM. The reason for that is because this is going to be the only way that the, the RAM or that this data will be able to be communicated to and from the CPU in any sort of efficient fashion. So if I, let's say I, I have all of these programs open and all of a sudden I want to open up Word. I have it running, but I bring it to the foreground, so I just start using it and I start typing it. You might notice and you might remember it from your own experience that if you have a lot of programs open, sometimes when you try to switch from one to the other, it just takes forever and forever, and it just, it just doesn't, it seems strange. Why should it do this? It just seems to be getting overloaded. The reason is that the computer is loading this from virtual memory. It's moving the contents of the virtual memory into actual memory. It's being, it's replacing something else, so not only does this have to be loaded into memory, but this other something else has to go into virtual memory. So there's kind of an easy way that we can resolve this performance problem, especially if you get really annoyed. If this happens to you a lot, there's something that we can do to fix this problem, and what might that be? Yeah, just buy more RAM. So you might know um, that you might be able to upgrade the RAM in your computer, for example, and if that's an option that that's, and this is something that happens to you, then this might certainly be something that you want to try. Uh, yes? The virtual, so can you expand the virtual memory in the hard drive? Yes, so what I did was I just drew an arbitrary chunk of hard drive. The operating system actually manages how big or how small this, this section of virtual memory should be. So it might take up a larger percentage, might take up a, a lower percentage. Modern operating systems especially pretty much prevent you entirely from knowing the settings or being able to tweak the settings of how much virtual memory is being used. Um, but older operating systems, older versions of Windows and Linux and, and Unix allow you to tweak and you can actually set a hard upper limit on how much virtual memory you can use. And if that happens, if you, can, if you actually prevent the computer from, say, using virtual memory at all or from expanding virtual memory when you need it, then you might start getting out of memory errors just because it has nowhere to load these bits of information into RAM. So yes, so you can upgrade your RAM, and this is a very, very useful upgrade, especially if you're seeing this, this sort of symptoms that, that I'm describing. You might want to upgrade RAM, or another thing that might be useful is if you're thinking of buying a new computer. If it's more than just this RAM problem um, that you're having, you might consider purchasing your next computer with a bit more RAM than usual. And most of the time, you can actually see um, how much virtual memory is being used. So not only can we see here in this pie graph um, where it tells me, and this is sort of unreasonable, and this is why I don't like to use this exactly, it tells me that my virtual memory size, VM size, is 173 gigs. But that doesn't might make a lot of sense because the hard drive in this computer isn't even 100 gigs large. So something else is going on. We can actually see the raw files that make this up, and we can see that I have something called swap files. These are, it's just another name for virtual memory. We can see that I have several that are um, hundreds of megabytes large, and even one that's a gigabyte large. So I'm actually, um, so this computer has allocated quite a bit of memory to virtual memory for this, for this express purpose. Do you mind sorting by the RAM column and activity monitor? So those of you with PCs can do this, something similar as well. If you'd like to make a mental or written note, if you have a PC at home tonight, 
right click on your, on your taskbar, that's the thing on the bottom of your window where all your program icons appear, right click there, choose task manager, and then you'll see a very similar interface and you can sort by processes, processes or programs. So what Dan just did, which is a useful sanity check, if for instance you're being upsold at some store, you need more RAM, this is why your computer's slow, well you can try to corroborate with that with some data, not necessarily looking at the more esoteric numbers, but just the raw numbers. Like this top row in the Dan's table, it says that Safari, which is a browser, like Internet Explorer, is using how many megabytes? 198 megabytes, so that's like 200 megabytes. And mind you, his Air only has two gigabytes, so that's already using like a 10% of his memory. So if you just ballpark add up some of those numbers, you can get your own good sense of just how much RAM am I actually using. And if you're already adding all that up, approaching two gigabytes, for instance, well then maybe it makes sense to spend the $50, $100, or whatever it is. So PC users, same heuristic. Good question. So how does it know actually how large it is? So it's more than just the program. Yes, it does have to load the program itself into memory, um, but just about every program has associated with it some content. And in this case, the content for Safari is the web pages that I have open in the various tabs. And each of these web pages, it actually also has to load into memory. So the text, the images, the layout of all of these web pages has to be remembered so that when I go from one tab to the, to the other or from one window to another, it's actually able to show me that same web page without having to go back and reload the entire page, if that makes sense. So as I start browsing and as I open more windows, then I would expect the memory usage to go up. And actually, web browsers, of, of all things, are, are actually really, seem to be really, really terrible about keeping their memory usage low. You might have heard of this, this term of a memory leak, for example, or this, it's this, um, this idea that these programs, and not, I'm not necessarily saying that these programs have a memory leak, but there is this idea that these programs just keep using more and more and more and more memory. And this is a bad thing because you don't have more and more and more RAM. You have a fixed amount of RAM. So if one program keeps using more RAM when you don't want it to, you will start to realize that you are running out of, of performance or you are running out of RAM and you are getting these performance problems that we stated before. And, uh, and a symptom of this of this particular problem of a memory leak is if you look at this task manager and you sort based on how much memory a particular program is using, and you notice that over hours, or even better, over days, that it just keeps getting larger and larger and larger, even though you're not doing anything significantly different, then there is a, a pretty high probability that that program has some sort of a memory leak. And usually what you can do to fix it is just quit the program entirely, which closes it down so it doesn't use any memory, or well, it's a bit of a white lie, but it, it stops using a lot of the memory and then you can reopen it and usually this will be able to solve this particular problem. Yes? So in my long process, so they don't separate the processes of the web pages, like Safari and Firefox and not Chrome, when you close a window, it doesn't, the RAM that that window is using doesn't get freed up, right? So let's uh, say I'm not quite sure I, n I understand your question. Right. Yes, so it does depend very much on how these programs are written. So there's this concept of something called garbage collection. Basically, when the program doesn't need the RAM anymore, it, it has to tell the operating system, OK, you can, you can use this RAM now. I don't need it any longer. And some programs are worse than others at actually freeing up the memory that it no longer needs. And so um, that is why, yes, why Google, for example, in their Chrome browser, advertises very heavily that each tab in the browser is, is a unique space, so to speak, in memory, because then when you close that one tab, then it's able to free up all the resources of that one tab, rather than assuming that all of the resources are devoted to an entire window. So it's just a different way of, of doing this, and it's probably more efficient in terms of, of memory usage to do this. But it is, at the same time, more difficult for them to actually program it that way, and so that's why it's, it's not something that we see typically. So that's just, it's sort of like an extra step or a step above and beyond what we would normally see. Did I see another question? Yes. Um, 
Mm -hmm. So, OK. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so right now what you're seeing is that the real memory seems to be relatively static and the CPU is changing. And so this is actually a really good question. Why on earth might this be? Why might Safari and Firefox, two web browsers, be using some CPU, which implies that there's some processing going on in the background? Why, why might this be? So n almost, uh, so yeah, page refresh, and that is actually a, a, good, a good point. If there was a page, for example, that automatically refreshed, let's say it's, uh, a stock website might do this, for example, where you wanted to see the latest stock, so it might refresh the, the page automatically, and that means that it has to use some CPU cycles in the background to actually be able to um, download this, this additional information. And just about anything, um, on web pages these days, there's a lot of movement going on. There's a lot of just stuff happening. Like I have Apple open, for example, and there's this animation going on in the background. And so even though it's not front and center, this is still using so-called CPU cycles, or it's still using a percentage of the CPU's time to be able to actually process this and not display it to us. So um, uh, anything that involves animation or even uh, something like Flash, for example, if you're on YouTube, and watching a flash video, then you might see um, you might see quite a bit of CPU, especially if, if you're on a Mac. Flash is, is really, really horrible about CPU usage, and you, you'll see a big jump when we start playing um, some, some flash videos on this machine. You'll see a big jump in the in the usage of the CPU. Do you, now, mind, do you mind toggling over? OK. In fact, if you forgot last week, this is us a week ago on camera here. This is the course's website. So this is linked on the course's homepage right now. And just to prove Dan's point, here's my activity monitor. And what do you notice about my browsers? If I zoom in up here, oh, it's just going to fit. So just to give you an idea, our computers are essentially identical, but the CPU usage looks very, very different. Flash video is awful about using CPU speed. And we have dual cores, which essentially means we each of these models of computers have essentially two CPUs inside of them. So sometimes the percents might add up to more than 100% because you would have 200% capacity. But uh, if you want to try an at-home experiment, just go to any site like YouTube or the course's website once we have more content and try playing two videos at once or three videos at once or four. Very quickly are things going to break, largely because of this computational reason. If you have a PC, Flash isn't actually that bad on it. It seems to be pretty well optimized on there. Uh, this is a great experiment if you have a Mac. Um, but um, on a PC, it's, it at least seems to be a little bit more reasonable. Um, but switching back to here, you'll notice that there's actually some other pretty interesting information that this same activity monitor can provide to us as well. And specifically, it divides the memory into more than just one uh, column. So we expected, and, and what we saw was how much real physical RAM each program is using. But, and this is where um, this oversimplification of me breaking it down, dividing actual chunks to specific applications, this is where this sort of breaks down. You notice that each application also uses a certain amount of virtual memory. That's because it just can't load everything into memory. And so the program, the operating system is asking the program, is there anything you can let me send to virtual memory, anything that you don't need that I can just file away for a little bit. And then when you need it, you can have it right back, but I just need this memory for something else. And that's basically what's happening here as well. Now, there's one more interesting column that you see that, that uh, we alluded to last week, and that is, that is this kind column, where last week we were talking about how we have these different types of CPUs that are labeled as, say, 32-bit or 64-bit. And software, as we mentioned, has to be rewritten to use the however many bits the CPU is able to, to process. And so if you have a Mac, you'll generally see this pretty easily. On a PC, um, I, I think you'll just have to know if Windows is 32 bits or 64 bits. But here, at least, we're able to see that some of these applications, some of these processes, have been already rewritten or updated for this newest version, for this 64-bit version of the CPU. And you can find that in this kind column, where you can see, uh, for example, I have to move over a little bit, Safari, for example, is 64-bit. But Firefox isn't yet. 
the finder, which is uh, basically like where I see all of my folders and, and my hard drive, the contents of my hard drive, that has also been rewritten to be 64 bits. And now, it doesn't mean that when you, when you see this and you have a list of applications that are not 64 bit, there are less like 32 bits or heaven forbid 16 bit, uh, that it means that that application is no longer usable in some way. Um, many times, I mean, it's, it's, this seems to be something like, um, like well, I'm, I'm very digital photography minded, so I have a lot of analogies to digital cameras. But just like how for years we had this war of megapixels, more megapixels doesn't always mean it's going to be a better camera necessarily. And luckily now I think manufacturers are figuring this out. But similarly, because we have more bits, it doesn't necessarily mean that the program needs it or that it's actually going to be faster. Now we implied that having a 64-bit uh, CPU and having 64-bit um, software means that you will be able to have a faster computing experience. And that certainly is true in the general case, but usually the benefits are actually somewhat small. Like in this case, I think it's, they, they, they say it's something like 10% increase in performance, which may or may not be negligible if it's not the CPU that's the bottleneck in this processing. Um, so it's just, uh, it's just something to keep in mind that a lot of these numbers that manufacturers love to throw at you are just numbers. They're just marketing speak and it's really the one piece of the whole equation that you have to take into account when considering purchasing a computer or when considering the performance of a computer um, or any other of these particular factors. Um, any questions on this before we move on? Okay. So we talked about, oh, we do have one, sorry. <laughs> What are threads? Okay, um, so a program, so we might have one program like Safari for example, that can split itself into what you can think of as separate programs in memory. Uh, so what we actually see is this one program. We actually see one web browser uh, and it has you know, this many windows open, it has this many tabs open for example, but the programmers can decide that it might be optimal if they, for example, assign, and this is just an example, if they assign one web page to its own mini program in memory. So that way each one is independent and each one can fight for its own CPU time, can fight for its own memory. Uh, and so what you get is if you have, say, one tab that's taking forever to load, it doesn't mean that the other tabs will be stuck if that makes sense. So they can, they can split these into separate processes to try to make it easier to complete a larger task. And usually we call these programs multi-threaded um, and generally that seems to be the push, especially these days where we have multiple cores, where we have one physical CPU but it looks like it's two separate CPUs, just as uh, David mentioned before, how we might actually see, for example, two CPU graphs rather than just one, even though there's just one physical CPU in here. So as we start splitting these into more and more cores, and these days it's getting ridiculous. We're seeing like um, eight core, 16 core, 32 core, and, and you know, very large servers. All of these cored machines, and if you have one program that can only have one thread, that can only work on one core, you're wasting all of the other cores that you have. So um, to be able to use this idea of having separate cores effectively, uh, frequently we will see mul these multi-threaded applications just to be able to maybe assign one thread to one core and another thread to another core and so on. Does anyone remember the days 10 years ago when you would go to print a document and you would be told printing dot 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 and you would then have as the human to wait all 10 minutes for every one of the pages to run be to print before you could actually start typing again? Yay, nay? Okay, if so, that was not multi-threaded. One thread, which means you can only do one thing at once. And so multiple threads are generally a good thing. And just to make this into a more modern example, um, like this web page, for example, this Apple web page, which has this animation that, as we saw evidenced in, in this uh, activity monitor, was happening in the background, you notice that I can still use other tabs while that animation is happening in, these, in this other Apple tab that I don't see. And so if, it, if this was single threaded, then as that animation was being processed, then it would basically block 
all other processing from happening in that, in this application, it would be really horrendous to have to wait for that animation to finish before I could click on another link in another tab, for example. So, um, I mean, all of these things, it's, it's, it sounds complex now, but it's definitely just small steps. It's always been small steps in trying to achieve this sort of greater goal that uh, to be able to multitask better on, on machines. And um, we have, uh, as you know, a lot of space on these hard drives. And we're trying to break down how all of these work together. But one of the things that we didn't really get into, we only touched on last week, was how a hard drive actually works. And uh, we actually have a hard drive that um, we'll be able to take apart for you and show you the inside and show you actually what it looks like um, in just a second. But just as a quick reminder, what happens on the inside of a hard drive? We just talked about this very briefly. You might remember that floppy disk as a good analogy for this. So if, when we open this up, what do we expect to see? Yes. Platters, yeah, so these metallic platters, and then we'll also expect to see something else to be able to read data from those platters. Yeah, heads, right, exactly. And so we'll see just a variety of things that will help us actually look into this hard drive. All right, so here we have the outside of the hard drive, and, and uh, if you ever do decide to take apart your computer and get to the point where you can actually read the data on the hard drive. Um, a lot of it is, is not very useful to us, um, but some of it is. For example, we can typically find out the capacity of the hard drive on the label. In this case, this is a 10 gig hard drive. So this one isn't a very modern drive, and that's why, that's why we don't care that it's, um, that it's going to be opened. And in fact, you can see we've already messed it up a little bit. Um, but some other information might be, for example, the, not only the brand, but also the model number of this drive. If you ever have a failed hard drive, and since the hard drive is, you know, consists of spinning platters that move very, 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 very quickly, these things will tend to fail. It's a mechanical part, and, and after a while, everybody expects a hard drive to fail. And so this is definitely one reason you should back up all of your data. But the other reason is that you just have no idea when it's going to go. When it goes, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, sometimes you might get lucky and be able to recover some data, but for the most part, that's it. You're out of luck. Um, so do be sure to, to back up your hard drive because that is something that's very important. But if this happens, and let's say you have backed up your data and you decide that you don't want to throw away the entire computer, you'll just replace the hard drive, usually what you might do is actually either contact the manufacturer or contact the manufacturer of this drive specifically and see if it's under warranty. Frequently, these hard drives have warranties of years, three or five years. You might be able to get away with getting a brand new hard drive at the same capacity um, for free without having to, to spend any additional money. So this can be something that's, that's very, very useful. Now, we've already taken this drive apart uh, because we've learned the hard way in the past that it's very difficult to work with all of the screws and finding all of them underneath the, uh, the label and everything. But if we were to actually do this right now, um, what you would notice is that after we remove enough screws and there's a small gap in the hard drive, it, it's, almost like this, um, it's almost like it depressurizes. So they actually have it so well sealed uh, because of, of this, this tight tolerances in here um, that you would uh, be able to hear this change in pressure. So moving this out of the way, let's see if I can do this enough. I guess we should have bothered to take this one last screw off. We can see here the platters that exist on this drive. And it looks. And the ceiling. Yeah, and the ceiling, and the camera up here. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because it looks very mirror like. And if I were to actually touch this drive, I would undoubtedly ruin all of the data that's on it. And the reason for this is that each of these, or what, you, what we don't see, are very, very small magnetic particles that exist on the surface of the drive itself. So this is very similar to the diagram that we saw last week for floppy disks, for example. And so there's these magnetic particles that can be oriented into two different ways. So because these particles have a north end and a, and a south end, just like, um, just like you would know if you picked up a magnet, um, then we also can do the same thing with these particles. And we can rearrange them 
in a certain direction. So for example, we say, okay, if north is facing right, then we think of that as a one, and if north is facing left, then we think of that as a zero. So we can send a small electrical current down this wire over here, and it, and it basically polarizes this magnet. And this magnet then rearranges these magnetic particles, just like if you had a magnet and you have iron filings and you're able to arrange them into a neat pattern. It's the same sort of idea. We're having, we have this head whose purpose is to rearrange the magnetic, the, the magnetic uh, particles on the drive itself and orient them in the proper direction of the one or the zero that we want to store on the computer. Then when we want to read this data off of the hard drive, we just, we don't send any electricity down the wire, but it, the, the head spinning over, or rather the, the platter spinning under this head, as it'll move fast enough that um, it'll actually, a small amount of, of current will be picked up. It'll just know which direction north to south is, and it can read that as either a one or a zero, depending on which direction this particular particle um, was set. Now, um, for many years, hard drives had this sort of or orientation, where the hard drive spins in, in, in a certain direction, and the, um, and the particles fit tangentially to that, so just like you see here. But nowadays, and what was especially big uh, even a year or two ago, what you, one of the terms that you might have heard is this idea of perpendicular hard drive technology. They're saying, oh, this is gonna be the big thing that's really going to explode hard drive capacities, and it did for a little bit, but now it's, it's sort of reached its limit. And what they figured out that they could do was that instead of orient, orienting the, the particles in this direction, which is parallel to the direction that, that it's actually spinning, they figured that they could do it perpendicular, which means because they're thin like this, they can fit more onto the same space. And so this is just, um, this is not something that's really super important to know how computers work, but it is interesting, I think, in relation to some of the, the recent uh, technological advances that we've seen. This is one of the ways that they're able to innovate hard drive technology and get more capacity on the same size platter. So you, as you might know, we're increasing in hard drive capacity every year, and if the actual size of the hard drive itself doesn't increase, then how might we be able to get more bits onto this hard drive. What do these manufacturers have to do in order to make, to upgrade this hard drive from 10 gigabytes to now the two terabyte drives that we have today? So hundreds of times the capacity. What's that? So yeah, that certainly is something that we could do. We could add another platter underneath, and in fact, um, I'll try to show you, but I, I don't know if I'll be able to. Well, okay, this is a single platter hard drive anyway, but frequently what you will see is additional platters underneath. And unfortunately, there's only this one platter that we can see. And so we might have multiple platters. We might have one platter, two platter, three platter in multiple heads, or one head for each platter. And then we're able to just combine all of that capacity. But another thing that we would have to do is make these magnetic particles not necessarily smaller, but make the head smaller, be able to read a finer number of, man, of man, magnetic particles more reliably. So every time um, that we're, I mean, everything that, all of the technology that we're advancing, of course, gets smaller and things get better in that regard, and that is certainly an impact in hard drive capacity. We just have to be able to read smaller, smaller, and fewer, fewer quantities of these, of these bits of information. But this sort of implies a problem in that these particles are only so big. Yeah, they're really tiny, but they are only so big. And so um, we might reach what a lot of people consider is this hard limit, this upper limit of what we can actually store on hard drives. But frankly, I think we will come up with other types of technology before we start to reach that sort of problem. And, and we're already seeing that today with a different type of hard drive that's available under a different name. So it doesn't work like this, but does anybody know that? This new type of hard drive technology that everybody's really raving about? Yes. Solid yeah, the solid state disk, or the SSD. Um, it's not, it's much more like RAM in appearance than hard drives in that it doesn't have any uh, spinning parts um, and it looks like there's chips on the drive itself. And so what we have on the left here is a hard drive, and you can see in this picture uh, the heads a lot better. 
um, uh, hovering over the platter. And in the center here, we have a hard drive that is not operating with this, this head and platter, but is now a solid state drive. And it simply just looks like RAM chips, just sticks of RAM that are inside of a hard drive. But unlike RAM, this is non-volatile memory, which means that we can write to it, and it will remember that piece of information. And this is supposed to um, be the next big thing in, in computing. But unfortunately, just like RAM, this technology is still very, very expensive. And for the same price, for the same hundreds of dollars that you could spend on a very high capacity hard drive, you will now get a much lower capacity solid state disk. Um, but because we don't have these moving parts, we don't have a head that has to move around and try to find a piece of data on this relatively large platter compared to the size of the head, we can figure out, so we can find the data that we want on the solid state disk much more quickly. So it's much more like RAM in performance. It's still not as fast, but it's much more like RAM in performance. So loading programs, for example, becomes a lot quicker. Booting up your computer becomes a lot quicker. But this performance, as you know, comes with a price. And that is literally in, in dollars. And also um, in the capacity of the drive itself. There's just a hard limit on how much we can actually store on this now. So um, many computers now even, or many laptops even these days, advertise themselves as having uh, SSD drives in them. And if, if it has it, it is what it is. It will generally be more expensive than a similar capacity uh, a laptop with just a regular hard drive, but you might get some fringe benefits as well. So what might those be? So imagine that we have this platter, and this is very, very real. These, these hard drives um, spin at a certain speed, and usually you can find out the speed that that hard drive is spinning on the, on the label itself or on the, the technical specifications for the hard drive or even your computer. And typically, we see this number in the thousands of RPMs or revolutions per minute. And basically, what that means is that the platter spins 7,000 times every single minute, which is a lot. It's very, very, very fast. And the head is just hovering over it. Literally, it's, uh, a human hair could not fit between the platter that's moving at these incredible speeds and the head that's trying to read data off of it. So there's these very, very tight tolerances. And you can imagine, what if we have this sort of hard drive with a, you know, something that's spinning very, very quickly with the head precariously hanging o over it. We're using it in a laptop. And say we drop our laptop while it's spinning. What's going to happen? Well, you can imagine that the head might actually touch the surface. It might gouge some of these bits, some of this, these magnetic particles off of the surface of the hard drive itself, and we lose that data. It's just gone. It's not there anymore. And so physical jolts to hard drives are dangerous and bad. And, and while, yes, we have advanced to a point where now we can actually somewhat safely move them, gently at least, it just does not have the reliability that, frankly, the rest of the computer does, because the rest of the computer just does not it does not have as many moving parts. So that is the other thing about these SSDs that everybody really likes, especially in laptops, is that it removes sort of the last remaining of really mechanical part of the computer. Anyone have a guess what the last view might be? Sound noise? Sound noise? So um, well, the speaker might move a little bit, but for the most part, it's not. Uh, those, those can withstand jolts. So those people don't, don't seem to be too, com, too um, concerned about those. Yes? CD-ROM Yeah, so CD-ROM drive. So the optical drive, as you know, it's, it's also something where a CD actually spins inside of the drive. That's another mechanical component. But also fans. So every laptop has to have a number of fans to be able to cool this processor that gets very, very hot because it's doing a lot of computations in a very small space. As you might recall from some of the, uh, the images that we had last week, the CPU themselves themselves are actually really quite small compared to the actual size of the computer. Like this was a picture of a motherboard, and the CPU fits on this white box right here. But the actual, actual portion of the CPU that does the computation is even smaller than that. Keep in mind that most of this area was for these pins to actually do the communicating uh, back and forth from 
the motherboard. So we have this very small CPU that's doing a lot of computation, and it's just going to get very, very hot. So as you might recall, we have to have this idea of a heat sink to be able to cool it off. And to supplement that, we also have to have some fans just to move air over it, just like um, in, in the summertime when, when you're hot and you don't have air conditioning for whatever reason, you might try to fan yourself just to get some of the air moving. The same sort of thing applies here. But luckily, fans are not all that important uh, in terms of, of the data. Like if a fan fails, your computer might get hot, um, but your data is most likely still safe unless you allow it to overheat. Yes? Right. Right. So a solid state drive is closer in technology to say a USB thumb drive, uh, which is able to maintain its data on the chip versus say the um, uh, versus RAM, which requires constant electricity to be able to maintain its state. Um, but how it actually works, um, I'm not. I'm not actually too familiar. Do you happen to know? Yeah, it's, it's, it is electronic. It's not at all um, magnetic, and it's not mechanical. Nothing actually moves. But essentially, you have electricity flowing into um, little cells inside the device, such that if you charge up one of those cells, once you remove power to the device, it actually remembers the state in which you left it. And so that's the fundamental difference: is that it retains its state, unlike RAM, which needs electricity constantly to refresh the signal that's there. Great question. OK, let's take a five minute break. When we come back, we'll continue talking about hardware. All right, so for real this time, let's take a break from some of this new material and go over some of the old material that we talked about last week. So I have here a, basically the back of a computer, and it's showing us some ports, uh, some ports that I can connect some devices to and that I will be able to expand uh, my computer's capabilities through some input devices, through some output devices, through a variety of connectors. And so who can remind me what these connectors are? So let's start up here in this upper left-hand corner and ignore the icon to the left of the, of the <laughs> port itself. But uh, what is this port? It's close. It's, it's, a, it's a parallel port. And so these are now being phased out, luckily, because they look very, very similar to serial ports, which are basically shorter versions of the same. Then underneath this, what is this port right here? Trick question. Yeah, so this one is actually a serial port. So as you can see, it is very, very similar. And it's also good that they're phasing these out as well, because they look very similar to VGA. VGA is a type of display connector that we use for, say, projectors and older monitors. Not a lot of the newer monitors use something else. So moving on here, so what about these two teal and light purple ports uh, sort of in the middle? Yeah, mouse, but that's what the icon says. What are they called? So, yeah, PS2, perfect. So this, these are PS2 ports. And again, a lot of these, so the serial port, the parallel port, and the PS2 port seem to now be replaced by one port. What, which one might that be? It's very ubiquitous. USB. USB. And so where do we find these USB ports? So yeah, on the right in this, in this uh, black color here. So we have here a variety of, or not a variety, but a number of USB ports that we can use to expand on these computers. And generally, this seems to be a good thing, that we're able to now get rid of some of these larger, bulkier ports, and frankly, much slower, and be able to use these newer ones. And so we have next to this a variety of um, audio ports for speakers, headphones, input, output of, of various sounds, um, and we'll ignore those. But what about this last port in gray in the upper right-hand corner? What does this one do? Ethernet, yes. So this is what allows us to connect to our home network. So if we don't have wireless at home, we're most likely using this Ethernet cord uh, to be able to connect our computer to a network. Now there's one more question that I want to ask about this, and this might be useful um, for you at home even. So you'll notice that between these ports, there's a line of these lights right here. What on earth might these lights, labeled A, B, C, and D, 
what might these lights do for us? Now, not all computers will have these, but some will. And if they do, they can be useful. But why? Drive letters, uh, no, but that's, a, that's actually a really good guess. But usually what manufacturers do is they will show a small number of lights to try to provide some diagnostic information or some troubleshooting information. Let's say you try to turn on your computer and it doesn't boot for some reason. Something is, and, and I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm talking about something really bad, like it starts beeping at you and crazy stuff is appearing on the screen or nothing at all. Usually what you can do is try to find the manual for your computer, see if you have lights like these, and try to decode what the information is telling you. Sometimes it might say, oh, I have a bad stick of RAM installed, or oh, my CPU has gone bad, or oh, I can't communicate with the video card, or something like that to help you narrow down the many types of different problems that we could have. And in fact, all of these devices that we have here, yes, hard drive, uh, are still sort of the last remaining mechanical device in a computer that we really, really care about. But it doesn't mean that these are the only devices to fail. We might have a RAM failure, or we might have a CPU failure, each of which would be catastrophic, especially if it happens while your computer is actually running. So you can imagine that if we have some, some ones and zeros in, in some block in memory that all of a sudden can't function anymore, we can't read from them anymore, then the computer might get confused, so to speak. It might not understand the data that's being sent to it, and this might result in a crash. So you might very, uh, very frequently see like these uh, blue screens of death or something similar, and it usually indicates some, it may not indicate a hardware problem because there's a variety of reasons, but one reason could be that some piece of hardware in your chain of computation has gone bad and, and needs to be replaced. Unfortunately, if you have just a little bit of your RAM that seems to have gone bad, you usually have to replace the entire stick. It's not worth actually removing a small chip from, from one stick and replacing it. It's just more trouble than it's worth, and for the most part, probably entirely um, impossible. This does recall last week's unofficial homework assignment, which was to take your or a friend's computer and yank all those things out. And anyone do it? A few of you, yeah. And uh, is anyone's computer still working? Yeah? Okay, so that is always the challenge. And I was going to show on this screen for just a sec, if you don't mind. Um, this is which adapter, if you can tell from my not so. Okay, so this is in fact a USB connector. It's rectangular. And if, Dan, you don't mind bringing up the other uh, screen again with the ports? It's one of the, we've, Dan and I have talked about this, stupidest designs for a port connector. There is a little trivia question. Why are all those other things trapezoids? So you can tell which way it goes. So I have spent literally 50% <laughs> of my life trying to plug this in the wrong way. So I offer this only because if you're a little timid at this point or you know, aren't quite sure which way is up, I mean, neither are we sometimes. So. Though I found also another unfortunate thing about USB is that, and this is a really poor design for this motherboard that they put the Ethernet port right next to it because you'll notice that the width is essentially the same between the two. And I have done, mm far too many times plugging in a USB when I'm just sort of like trying to reach around the back of the computer without actually seeing it, plugging it into an Ethernet port, you know, clap, clapping my hands, thinking I'm done and nothing is actually happening. It's because I plugged it into the wrong port um, because some idiot decided that it would be a great idea to make this the same width um, as, as an Ethernet port. And all of these ports uh, represent, you know, faster, newer technology. USB even has gone over a couple of revisions over time. The first one only allowed a speed of about 11 megabits per second, which as you might recall, we have to do what to figure out how many megabytes this is? Eight. Divide by eight, yeah. So we divide this by eight and it's something like one and a half, it's a little less than one and a half megabytes per second. And that's not a lot of data. And so we had this new version of USB that has the exact same connector but the device or the cable had to be rated as USB 2, which you might be familiar with. Nowadays, pretty much everything is USB 2, so you don't have to worry. But even, um, but if you have an old cable, you might want to make sure that it's not an older USB 1 cable. But anyway, USB 2 now has a much faster speed, of about 480 megabits per second, which is theoretically a high speed of about 60 megabytes per second and a lot more reasonable in terms of the amount of data that we're trying to push around to and from our computers. I mean, it's not gonna be very useful for keyboards because I don't think any of us can type that fast or even all of us put together 
can type that fast to do that, but for say external hard drives or something that we're connecting that requires a lot of data going in and out, having this additional amount of, of technology or having this additional amount of bits being able to flow through the wire is very useful. And computer makers aren't stagnant in this. In fact, they're trying to figure out what's going to come up next. And people have, and, and some companies have come up with a, a specification for USB 3, which I think will, will require a, a new uh, port, but it's going to be a lot faster. But now Intel and Apple have worked together to uh, come up with this new technology, something that we haven't yet seen in an actual computer, but will be very interesting when we do, called Light Peak. And this will require an entirely new connector. And as you might imagine, it uses fiber optics in some really fancy way. But if we actually take a look at what they're saying this will be capable of, they're saying that we will be able to get a minimum of 10 gigabits of data every second, which is orders of magnitude faster than these slower ports that we saw. So USB 2 is stuck at 480 megabits per second, or 0.48 gigabits per second compared to now 10 gigabits over this new connector. And, and we haven't actually yet seen any technology coming out, but this is just to show you, this is the reason that we're always having to get new devices that, that support the new fanciest port and connector because there's, it will allow more data um, to, be, to flow over the cable or the connection. But there are other uh, ports that are interesting and useful to know, like USB, for example, uh, this one now is, seems to be getting a little bit long in the tooth, but FireWire, for example, is very prevalent on Macs and is very useful if you're at all interested in working with video on your computer. If you have a video camera, for example, a DV video camera, most likely you have a FireWire port on it. And unfortunately, FireWire can go by a variety of names depending on who you're talking to. Apple, for example, will reference it by that name, by FireWire. But Sony, Dell, and others won't call it that. They'll call it by its sort of technical name, IEEE 1394, something like that. And Sony, I think, even goes so far as to call it iLink, which is confusing. But basically, you have, just like USB, a different set of connectors. And so um, you might know that um, you, for many of your cell phones, you probably have a charger that allows you to charge the cell phone via USB, where you have the, the regular USB connection on one end that you plug into your computer than a smaller USB connection on the other end. So USB does have multiple versions of the connectors from the regular sized one to smaller mini USB connectors as it's called. And FireWire has the same sort of thing. So we have a typical connector, which is here on the left, um, and, or this, uh, this cable on the right, which is sort of larger than the smaller version of the connector, which is found on the left of the picture or the right of the diagram above. And uh, so if you want to, so this is something that we haven't seen on any of the photos of these, of the motherboards or anything like that. So if you have a port that you weren't familiar with, check to see, it might be a FireWire port um, that you have on your specific computer. Now there are some other ones as well that are really useful to know. Um, and these pertain to uh, the, your monitor or your display. Now for the longest time, VGA was the connection to have, and it looks like this top left connector up there. And, and most projectors, if not all projectors, have still a VGA connector. But this was not actually a, a digital connection, and so the push has been towards newer digital ones, such as DVI. So digital video uh, uh, connector that we, that we see here in the middle is now very prevalent on LCD displays, for example, because these are digital displays versus you might, you know, the old tube style, you know, make your desk sag in the middle, sort of large monitors. Luckily, we phased those out in favor of these lighter, thinner, slimmer models. Um, but with that, we also had to have a newer connector to support the digital um, aspect of these monitors. So we see this DVI connector. Now, um, for all of our speak about Apple, and even though we use Apple machines, David and I, I mean, one of the things we absolutely hate is the fact that they don't seem to really use these connectors on their laptops. Because these connectors, as you can see from the DVI, is actually really quite large. And so what they instead make you do is have all of these stupid like adapters to be able to connect your, your laptop to a variety of things. So I have to have basically like an emergency kit of cables 
that I have to carry around just in case I happen to come across a monitor that I have to be able to connect to. So in this case, this is a DVI connector, for example. Uh, do you still have the camera up? Uh, yep. So this is a DVI connector, for example. On the other end, which I actually plug into the laptop, is something, oh, they have so many different versions. I, I, I want to say that it's a mini DVI connector, but it's stupid, frankly, that they have so many different things. And then I have the VGA <coughs> adapter connected, and it's really quite a big pain to have to go back and forth between all of these. There's one that's not pictured here called DisplayPort and Mini DisplayPort. That is a big push uh, by Apple and ATI, which is a, a video card manufacturer, to try to develop because it is a smaller connection uh, than most of these. And so newer computers, you will generally see, especially if it's a desktop, you'll probably see a DVI connector and maybe, if you're lucky, a DisplayPort connector versus, say, VGA. Um, and many newer laptops as well will try to use uh, either uh, a small version of the DVI or a, or a mini display port or something like that uh, to be able to connect a monitor. But now it seems to me that in recent years we've just had this flood of additional video connectors and it's just been annoying to have all of these, um, these adapters. It'll be nice when they can settle on one and use that for a little. I just want a few years with the same like, connector just reliably. Now, if you are at all familiar with, um, or not even familiar, but interested in connecting your computer or a high-definition device like a Blu-ray player or a, a PlayStation 3 or Xbox or any of these sorts of uh, video game devices, then you might use a different uh, connector altogether called HDMI. And I reference it not because it's useful for TVs, but because you can actually convert. It's actually compatible with the DVI connector. Not the physical connector itself, but you don't have to buy really super expensive adapters. It's, it's literally just a cable adapter like this to be able to get a DVI connection to work with, with an HDMI connection. So most likely, if you have a flat screen TV at home and your computer has a DVI connector, you can co directly connect via some simple DVI to HDMI connector. Uh, you can directly connect your computer to your TV and be able to get all sorts of uh, you know, silly, funny um, YouTube videos up on your TV and, and a variety of, of other things. Now, um, one of the things that I mentioned before was this Blu-ray player. And so Blu-ray is actually this new and emerging optical standard. And it's still, it's been around for a few years, but it still has not reached the sort of uh, cachet of DVD or even CDs of, of a few years back. But even though all of these discs look the same, and if you look at them, you'd probably be pretty hard pressed to tell which is which because they're the same physical size, they're the same physical dimensions, um, but they store very different amounts of data. So a CD, for example, might hold about how much data? 700 megabytes, yeah. That's Pretty decent, that's okay, but what about a DVD? So just like some of the DVDs that we have here, what can a DVD hold? Four gigabytes. Yeah, so about 4.7 gigabytes. But in addition to that, we can also have what are called dual layer DVDs, which means that we can double that capacity. Sometimes we can even flip them over and have dual layer on that side so we can quadruple the capacity, but that's uh, silly to flip it over, so we'll ignore those for now. So now in just one evolution of this technology, we have a lot more capacity um, in, in our optical discs. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with DVDs, but only recently does it seem really ubiquitous that you know that you can buy a computer and, and be able to have a DVD burner on it and be able to burn DVDs, burn your home movies onto them, or to burn a lot of data onto it. And unfortunately, Blu-ray, even though it now can store a lot more data, I think it's about 30 gigabytes of data on, on one side of this disc, um, it still has not reached this level. And in fact, um, even Apple, and I'm, I talk about Apple a lot um, just because they, they really seem to be setting a lot of trends in, in this space. And Apple right now absolutely refuses to have Blu-ray players or devices or even drives in their computers, even their very expensive machines. And they say that the software just isn't there. So for right now, Blu-ray still seems to be sort of on, on the technical edge, where if you have a Blu-ray drive, you know, you're, you're the cool kid on the block for having this, this technology. But it's, um, it stores a lot of data, but it doesn't seem to be, um, to, getting, to be getting anywhere. Now, I mean, we've been doing a lot of talking about um, being able to, or talking about specific uh, 
um, amounts of of numbers or, or quantitative data that you can use to figure out how much data or how much, uh, what sort of numbers, I suppose, you should expect when we're talking about each of these different things, like the CPU we expect in gigahertz, the RAM we expect in gigabytes, and the hard drive we might expect hundreds of gigabytes or even a terabyte. And so what we want to do is to actually show you, as if we were purchasing a computer, some of the specs that uh, you might find on a typical computer purchase and you will be surprised at how much data you actually are familiar with or how much you'll be able to understand just based on my and uh, David's blabbing for frankly the past uh, hour and a half and, and last week as well um, that there is a lot of information that you will be able to to gather here. So let's start just because I happen to be up on this uh, web page with a Mac Pro, for example. So usually on these, on these Apple ones, you can go to tech specs and figure out um, all, of, all sorts of data. So we'll start here with the processing. OK, so this must be referring to the CPU. And so you can see that there's a big graphic here for an Intel Xeon, which is just a type of CPU. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with, with the brand name Intel. But we can see that there's two different options. There's an eight core and a quad core. And uh, we've already told you that there's a distinction between the actual physical number of processors in a machine and the number of cores that that processor might have. And so this, is, this becomes apparent even now. So this eight core machine, for example, has two quad core processors, which means that there's two physical processors. Each one has quad core, and it comes in these different frequencies in 2.26 gigahertz, 2.66, or 2.93 gigahertz. So you might be able to guess now, which of these would be the fastest for you um, uh, in your particular situation? Now, moving on, we also see some other interesting stuff, like 8 megabytes of fully shared L3 cache per processor. Now, these L1, L2, L3 cache, we can't actually change this. It, it comes with the processor, basically. But it can be useful or interesting to be able to compare that from one computer to another. Um, and so in this case, we have 8 megabytes, which actually sounds um, pretty good. It sounds like quite a bit. Now, moving on to some of the other ones, memory, for example. We can see that the memory has a specific speed, which you might recall that we, we discussed uh, uh, um, last week when we were talking about the different types of memory. It comes not only in capacity, but in different speeds. And so this is saying that, okay, we have about a gigahertz of DDR3, ECC, SD, RAM. Who cares what that stands for? But it's that type of memory. And it tells us how much memory each of these comes with. So we can have up to 32 gigabytes of memory, which is quite a bit. And it comes in DIMM, sort of the, the actual raw um, slots, or rather the, the actual raw chips themselves, come in one, two, or four gigabyte capacities. OK, so moving on, we can see that we have um, now some expansion cards. So we reference just very briefly some expansion cards. And if, and if you might recall from our discussion of motherboards, we have a variety of ports on a motherboard, like this green port right here near the lower left, and these white ports underneath it. Um, we have these, this ability to slide in cards or expansion cards to be able to add in additional functionality. And most of the time, this comes in the, uh, uh, it comes in the form of, of graphics cards, because that pretty much everything else these days is on the motherboard itself. And usually, graphics seems to be the one thing that, uh, that, we, need, that we need to expand. And so we can get some information about um, this as well. It tells us that each of these has is a certain type, and it has um, so much memory, so on and so forth. And frankly, uh, this is a little bit harder. It's really difficult to say that one is necessarily better than the other. You unfortunately will have to do some Google research in order to, uh, to figure this out. OK, and so let's take a look now, skip some of these other ones, at some of the ports that are available to us. So this is telling us the connectors that a Mac Pro might have. So in this case, we can see that we have four FireWire 800 ports, five USB 2.0 ports, uh, two USB ports on the keyboard itself, which means that there's a, the keyboard is a hub. In other words, it's just a, it allows you to connect mo more than one USB device to it. Um, then you also have a headphone and internal speaker. And then you also have this capability for audio input, optical audio input and output, along with uh, regular headphones. And one of the things you'll notice 
that they don't seem to mention in this particular blurb is that it comes with not one but two Ethernet ports on this, on this particular model, which is um, actually pretty interesting. Do you happen to have something? Oh, yeah. it's segue. Del I can do the PC half if you want. OK. Um, so just looking at some of the other ones, um, PCI Express, we didn't touch on this a lot, but this is the formal name for those expansion slots that I was mentioning before. Um, the, the X16 or X4 monitor, moniker basically just tells you how fast each slot is. So generally, if you have a really, really fast expansion card, you want to put it in the faster one, uh, so on and so forth. But this just tells us how much expansion we have uh, in this particular case. Now moving on to the storage. So we can actually store quite a bit of data on this, but by default, we can choose from a couple of different drives. So a 640 gigabyte serial ATA drive. What is serial ATA? We didn't talk about it this time, but we referenced it last time. SATA is another way that we called it, another thing that we called it. Anybody remember what SATA is? Yes. Yes, it's, it's the internal connection from from the uh, from the motherboard to the hard drive. So in this older hard drive, for example, we used something called IDE or ATA. It's they're sort of used interchangeably, and it's this sort of big, wide connector uh, that we used. And if you remember those gray ribbon cables from last time, those were I, those were IDE cables. Serial ATA is a much smaller connector, so we know that we have serial ATA drives in this. Generally, that's a good thing because th that's, a, that's a faster connection. It also tells us how fast these, these particular platters are spinning at 7,200 RPM, uh, which is a pretty good thing uh, for us right now. And it also tells us some information about the optical drive, like we can read DVD minus plus R, W. Uh, it's a, such a big mess. Frankly, um, it, it, this doesn't really matter these days because pretty much all drives can read all of these different types. But uh, I think the one that you generally want is the DVD minus R. That's generally the, the best way to go when we're talking about um, these various DVD types. Yes? Is there a difference in storage between a plus and a minus? Is there a reason why some are plus and minus? Yes, um, the reason they're actually written to differently. So this doesn't apply to DVDs that you would buy from a store. So a video DVD, for example, pretty much any DVD drive can read that unless there's a problem with the drive. What this is referring to, the minus and the plus, is referring to different technology to actually write on the disk itself. And um, because it's written to differently, not all drives can read all different forms of this. And so that's why I mentioned there's, there's a lot of a lot of gibberish up here, and a lot of it's really uninteresting, but what seems to be the, the most reliable is this DVD minus R. And so these R's and RW's imply the ability to write or rewrite onto these disks. So just an R disk, for example, and the same thing applies with CDRs. Uh, the R moniker means that you can only write to it once. You write it, you burn it, so to speak, and that's it. You can only, you're done with it. But RW means that you can erase the data that, that you've written on it and rewrite you can write additional data on, on that same disk. And so that's the difference between these R and RW. You might also notice that we have DL. I, I quickly referenced uh, dual layer DVD disks, which allow double the capacity. And that's all that this is referring to, um, is the ability to write dual layer disks as well. Um, then there's some other um, electrical and some other stuff like size and weight. But as you'll see, and what David has up on his computer, is a comparison from the PC side. And a lot of these same, a lot of this same terminology also exists on that end as well. Oh, good segue. So here's Dell's website. It's a, I've been a fan of them recently just because we use them a lot for work. Um, and to be honest, there's a number of brands you can go with, right? There's HP, IBM, Dell, any number of others in the store. Personally, and I would say this also from a technical perspective, like you're generally well off, they're say better off buying even desktops online, for instance, from some of the online vendors. I, a lot of the stuff you would get at like Best Buy or those kinds of stores are honestly so often riddled with just so much crap that manufacturers have installed to give you a trial of this and a sample software of this, that when you get it home, you have so many damn icons on your desktop. And that's one of the contributing factors to a lot of PCs out of the box just being slow or slower than they need to be. So one of the upsides of going online and that doesn't mean Dell does not do this sometimes, is that 
systems might be a little cleaner. So just to give you a whirlwind tour. Um, Actually, if, if I can inter no, sorry, if I can yeah. interject for a second. So there, there are a lot of brick and mortar stores that have been in the news lately that, because they offer these so-called optimization, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, this ability where they're, you know, whiz kids or whatever they call them these days, will take the computer that you just bought and for a fee, they will quote unquote clean it up. They say that they'll remove some of this stuff and, and frankly what all they are doing is just preying on people's no, un, misunderstanding of what is going on. Usually there's a lot of uh, icons on the desktop, for example, but the, all they'll do is they'll just remove those icons. They won't actually remove the applications that those icons refer to. They say that they'll tweak settings to actually make it faster, but they, there was a, this sting operation of sorts by Consumer Reports where they actually found out that not only did it not improve the speed, but a third of the time it actually made the computers slower and so they're just offering all of these services that are frankly completely useless and now you as E1 students should be able to just buy the computer raw and frankly not perform this, this silly optimization service or if you really want just do it on your own. Just clean it up and customize it as you want. And the other caveat emptor is these extended warranty plans, they exist because they make the vendors money, which suggests mathematically you are the one who's being disadvantaged by them. So if you're completely paranoid, getting something like that might assuage some of your concerns, especially if they cover things like damage or spills, in which case that actually mitigates some, uh, some mistakes you might make. But for the most part, you're better off having like an American Express card and buying it with a credit card that actually doubles your warranty or something like that. Um, but just to give you a whirlwind tour here, um, first let me disclaim that so many of these websites, they're so overwhelming and Dell is no exception and even Apple, to be honest, once you start digging in, can be overwhelming, even especially for the neophyte. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on, let's choose a desktop here. I'll click, oh, it's, I'm already on the desktops page. So frankly, and I don't say this to sort of um, make, uh, to sort of pretend like I'm empathizing, I genuinely find this stuff overwhelming and completely uninteresting sometimes when you just want to solve a problem like buy a PC for yourself or buy a PC for your family. But we already have a number of options here, but what is striking is down below, the prices are really enticing these days. My God, to get a desktop computer for a few hundred dollars plus monitor often is really an exciting time when just a few years ago, these numbers would have an additional you know, zero at the end of them. But let me go ahead and pick the one that looks most familiar, Inspiron, it's kind of their consumer model. I'll scroll down here, and here too is where I very quickly start to lose interest, but here's one of the advantages of uh, um, introducing yourself to material in a course like this, is at least even if you can't quite tell what's the difference between this and this, you can begin to pluck out some of the terms, and you can latch on to terms or numbers that, ah, oh, I actually care about having this much disk space. Let's dive in deeper here. So let's not dwell on any too many of these specifics, but I'm going to go ahead and let's go with the cheapest. Uh, but not that one, that's kind of ugly. Uh, this is even uglier. Let's go with this. Look at all the ugly colors we can choose. So let me click continue. And now I get to this page and yet more options. And again, to empathize, this is to be expected to be a little intimidating. Um, but if you start to scroll down, you'll see the kinds of data points that Dan was pointing out. And this is where now, after even just a couple of lectures of a course like this, you can get a bit more comfy. Um, I think we'll <laughs> skip on that tacky little advertisement. <laughs> Since uh, actually that would be funny on that camera to funny. have a chat with Dell and start having asking them questions, but another day. Um, so one, uh, I'll just make a couple of points because most of this will just otherwise rehash what Dan said. There's other companies besides Intel. The biggest is AMD. They make compatible alternative processors to Intel, and they tend to be a little cheaper. Um, if for a typical user, it does not matter whether you have Intel inside or not. A lot of the markup in Intel is purely for branding purposes, so it doesn't matter so much. But you can see some familiar terms: 2.3 gigahertz. Uh, 512 kilobytes is referring to the L2 cache there, and this is referring to the memory speed. But um, it's the CPU speed that's perhaps of most interest. Um, the Vis uh, Vista tends to get a bit of a bad rap these days, so finding something with Windows 7 um, is probably the way to go now. People seem to be happy with that OS, but again, some familiar terms. And let me just go ahead and click Personalize, because finally it starts to get a little uh, more human friendly. So let's pick... Uh, Actually, if I can mention while you're, yeah. while you're um, picking a, a color for your new <laughs> desktop here. Um, so you'll notice that a lot of the times they really love to apply numbers to say processor speeds, but you really have to be careful to compare, to not compare the processor speeds when the two processors are not the same. You really, it really is only useful when comparing say two gigahertz versus three gigahertz on the same processor. 
And I'm talking about more specifically than the same manufacturer, I mean the same processor, because different processors can actually be faster or slower despite the speed. And so you, uh, if you're between two computers and one is an AMD and one is an Intel, you need more information than just that processor speed to figure out how fast that computer actually is. So it's just something to watch out for um, in, that, in that regard. And I think the caveats we'll offer here is if you continue personalizing, you'll try to, they'll try to upsell you at various points. And if you actually do the math, you'll find that paying for the most expensive CPU is probably not the best unit cost that you'll be paying. You'll be paying more dollars per gigahertz than you would by going at the uh, lower end of the spectrum. So a good rule of thumb, unless you really need to be on that bleeding edge, is to get something just short of the most expensive or just go with the default. Um, and it sometimes pays to do some of the math. But if you're talk looking at, for instance, a 2.8 giga, well, let's see, let's try to compare apples and apples here. So something like this. So a 2.8 gigahertz Athlon 2 X2 processor versus a 3.0 gigahertz, you're not going to really notice as a human that the additional 200 megahertz for the most part. But not to confuse things, if it's only $40 more, that depend then decide how elastic uh, your demand is for a few additional CPU cycles. Um, and then if we keep clicking through, we'll see some similar options as well. But do you mind if I come full circle back to Max and then turn it back to you? One of the conversations I've been having actually with um, a member of my family has been um, what she should get as her next computer, because her laptop's four or five years old, and it, it's sort of past its prime. A good computer these days, well, you should be able to squeeze three years, four years out of it. And after that, it should still work, but assuming you know things haven't physically broken, but you start to realize when using friends or other work computers that now the world is you know, progressing faster than your machine is. But it can get confusing here too. And so I've had um, my sister looking at MacBook Pros, for instance. And thankfully, one thing Apple does do well is have fewer options. So it's kind of ironic that fewer options is better. But I think it often is, because you, they've essentially taken the approach um, of good, better, best. And they used to literally say good, better, best. Now they have a few more options than that. But just to draw your attention to some common sense principles, you should really start by picking based on the metrics you care about. And what I've advised my sister is, first, go to the store, whether it's a Mac or a PC, and pick the screen size. Right, The thing that you, the human, the somewhat non-technical human, are going to notice and care about the most. Then once you pick something like that, let's say she decides 15 inches is good because 17 is too big, 13 is too small, well, then you can start looking at numbers like this. But if you look at these bottom three, Here's where, again, you probably don't really need to pay much to go from 2.53 gigahertz to 2.66 gigahertz. But from a marketing perspective, they probably throw in some other stuff. And sure enough, this left one is 250 gigabytes of hard disk. This one's 320. It's not much bigger, but they're throwing in some other stuff as well. And if you go from left to right, they'll start to add in more and more features. And you can still customize. But long story short, I would decide what's important to you. And odds are, for a typical person, screen size for a laptop is maybe the most compelling thing. And weight, which is somewhat commensurate with that. Um, and then after that, maybe disk space these days. If you've got a lot of music, a lot of movies, then maybe paying more for more disk space is worthwhile. If you'd like to use lots of programs, Photoshop, more RAM is good. And after that, the other details, especially the things the salesman might be rattling off, probably are less important in the end. And I think um, something that's interesting to note as well, that if you're actually comfortable doing this, you might notice that there's really not that big of a difference between, say, these three models. The biggest difference is in the processor speed, the RAM, and maybe also the hard drive. Now, many times with many computers, a lot of manufacturers like to add just a small amount of, of money to these, uh, more than what it would cost you to actually upgrade the memory to this amount yourself. And so, uh, let's see, as an example, well, it looks like in this case, they're all four gigabytes of memory. Uh, let's see. But what they will want you to do to upgrade to eight gigabytes of memory is to add $600 to the cost of this machine. And this is what, a $1,700 computer? You're, in, you're increasing the cost by a huge factor just to double the RAM. Now, instead of doing this, what you could do is actually upgrade some of these things yourself. On Apple machines, you really can only touch the hard drive or the RAM and maybe the hard drive. And so do your research first. You certainly can't just buy a new processor and plop it in because they are really expensive. But this is certainly a path that we really recommend. And it doesn't matter if it's Apple or any, or, uh, or, or any other manufacturer. Just shop around and see if buying additional RAM is cheaper
This way, and in this case it is, we can get eight gigabytes of RAM for $430. So we're saving ourselves about $170 by doing it ourselves. And frankly, these computers will provide instructions to you on how to change the memory, how to open it up, and uh, how to remove the memory, and how to add additional memory. And you can do it reasonably safely, especially if you remember some of the tips that we talked about in the first lecture. So just five minutes, 10 minutes, or maybe if you're really uncomfortable, 20 minutes of, of do it yourself, you can save yourself several hundred dollars in, in these upgrades. So if that's really all it, it is boiling down to for you is the difference between these models is the increase in RAM or the increase in hard drive, then investigate doing it yourself. Again, if it's processor, you probably should buy, buy the, the higher version from the company because that's going to be hard or impossible uh, to actually modify yourself. But if it's just something like RAM or hard drive, then this is something that you really should consider doing. Um, so this is, I mean, this, hopefully now you're able to look at a lot of this information and be able to understand it and, and figure out what's going on. And we certainly advise and recommend that you go to a brick and mortar store and take a look at these machines and try to ask the salesman some questions about maybe the RAM, the hard drive capacity, or maybe even these silly optimization features and just see what they try to tell you or how they try to upsell you. You might actually be surprised to say, to hear that they say, oh, you have to have, you know, four gigabytes of RAM for Windows 7 rather than, say, two gigabytes, which might actually be fine. And so you might be surprise yourself with the knowledge that you have on some of this hardware. Do you have a question? Is this not, oh, please, is it me? Yes, you. With this knowledge, could we buy something like a shell of a computer, which is the motherboard and the CPU, and then go out to a website like this and buy our own RAM and hard drive and make it much cheaper to assemble a computer as opposed to buying a uh, That's a good point. So what about just building your own computer? That is, it's actually really fun and really satisfying to do. And if it's something that you have the patience for, then you might give it a try. The, the problem, the only problem that I find with do-it-yourself computers is that if something fails, for example, you have to isolate this specific part because usually each company that you're buying different parts from, so for example, you might buy a Western digital hard drive and then you might buy an Asus motherboard, you might buy cables from somewhere else. You have to isolate the specific part that has failed and then go through that specific company for the warranty. This is compared to, say, a pre-built machine from Apple or from Dell, where you would be able to uh, you know, accept any upgrades. You'd be able to just send the whole machine back and say, just figure out what's going on with the, with the computer. Uh, so doing it yourself is fun and it is satisfying, but you have that, you have that additional component to it as well. Um, the other gotcha with it is that you have to be very careful to buy all of the components that will work together. So you can, yes, you can buy a motherboard, but usually you're only going to get you know, a picture, something like this, and maybe just a little bit of information about the types of slots that it has, like this. <laughs> and you might actually be able to, um, and by looking at the technical specifications, you might be able to know uh, what type of cards, for example, what type of PCI slots those are, what type of CPU socket that is. But this requires quite a bit of research to make sure that you get the components that will fit and will work together um, in order for you to do it. And so it, it really is a fun and interesting way of, of uh, getting your own computer up and running, but it can also be, at least the research part can be kind of harrowing. And there are so many screws. Like, I've yeah. done this before twice, and it was great fun, and you learn so much, and you know more about your computer than anyone, assuming it all works, but there's something really nice to be said for picking up the phone and a guy showing up when something goes wrong and literally installing a new drive for you. So I'd say it depends on what point in your sort of life or technical progression you're at. So do it once, do it twice, after that, add to cart. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Would it be more expensive just to, to build five parts as opposed it, to just the two hundred and three hundred dollar computer and a it depends is going to be my answer. It depends on what you're looking for. There's something to be said about economies of scale for people like Dell and such, um, whereby you can just get really good deals. Um, but if you're a gamer, someone who plays games a lot, or a graphic artist, and you really care about getting the, the, um, the speed RAM that you want and the graphics card that you want, 
you'll probably end up paying more building it yourself because you're going to keep upselling yourself getting the parts you care about. So I think it depends. But I would, I would say, I would counter and say that actually for the same specifications, like if you were to build um, the, the Dell machine that, that David configured on Dell's website, for example, and then you actually spent the time and the work actually building the exact same machine yourself, you generally will be able to do it cheaper. But again, you have to take the time that you're using into account. Like it, it takes non-zero time to make sure you buy all of the right components. It takes non-zero time to fit them all together, make sure it's all working and to fix any problems that there might be and then to install the software, et cetera, et cetera. So it is, you know, if, if you consider, you know, your time to be free to you, then that's, then that's certainly fine. But if, it's, if you think that, you know, spending an hour, you're losing money, then, then maybe you will, then maybe that will be a factor into the cost of, of building your own um, machine. And software is the gotcha too. We've not talked about it much yet last week and this week, but many of you, when you buy a, a new device like a camera or a printer, usually comes with a CD with software that you install. And the software that's on that CD are called drivers. Just means special software that makes that device talk to your computer. And if you start building your own computer, you can't just go to dell.com slash support, say I have machine 1234. Aha, here are links to all of the drivers for my particular computer. So that's a trade-off too. It doesn't mean it's, um, a bad thing, you can get them from the manufacturer's website, and even when you own a Dell, you might be better off going to the manufacturer's website for your video card, because their site's more up to date than Dell's. Um, so there's, there's upsides and downs. But it's definitely worth doing once, and if you're asking the question, you should do it. A good place to start to, uh, to actually get components, I think, is this website, Newegg. They generally have uh, pretty good prices on, on hardware. You should, of course, do some shopping around, but this is certainly a good place to go for a lot of your uh, a lot of your computer parts needs because they do actually sell individual parts uh, that you can get very easily. So as you can see here, all sorts of stuff like cables, cases by themselves, CPUs, there's hard drives down at the bottom, just a whole variety of things um, that you can just buy separately from this website. And the other upside to, uh, to Newegg is that they also buy a lot of these in bulk and pass those savings down to you. And so um, some people, say that um, the return policy is a bit of a nightmare on here, which might actually be true. But just buying the things if, and assuming that they work without you having to return them is actually uh, seems to be a relatively pleasurable experience uh, from, from this website. Yes? I suspect that's, yeah, um, I suspect them running out of stock on, on things happens pretty frequently. Um, but I would also counter and say that this, this was probably like a chance occurrence. And um, I mean, I've used Newegg dozens, literally dozens and dozens of times and without much of a problem. Um, if you are concerned about it, um, yet another website that you might consider taking a look at um, for stuff like this is a place called resellerratings.com. It's sort of like a, um, a Better Business Bureau online uh, where people can actually rate stores directly. And so in this case, you can actually uh, see New Eggs, um, let's see, rating on this particular case. So in this case, they have 30,000 reviews with an average review of, or an average rating of 9.65 out of 10. So that's, I think that's pretty respectable. Like if it was three or four ratings, maybe you should be a bit wary about it. They could be fake, for example. But 30,000 is a bit harder for them to fake. So this seems to be a, a pretty reputable uh, website and, and certainly a good place to go um, for your parts. Anything else? OK. Is the preview time? Yes. Well, uh, as you might recall, next week we have the first of two movie nights in E1. And? Ta-da. And here is a trailer. Um, assignment one, recall, was due uh, today, which was really just a survey, get to know you of sorts. We'll share some statistics once we've looked over the data. Um, assignment two will be posted to the course's website, computerscience1.net, sometime tomorrow. We're just in the process of finishing some technical setup. Um, and yes, next week, same time, same place. Uh, you're welcome to bring friends, family, dates, spouses, or others. Uh, we'll supply some popcorn and some things to eat. And the movie we will be playing is this one here.
Kids and Steve Jobs were never ordinary kids. Why only computer? Because they don't even want them to. And while they didn't know it then, their paths were crossed. Something really going on out there in California. To change their lives and change the world. I don't even think Abby knows who we are. Good. That's our stuff. You realize that's like still from a book? Hey, I'm Bill Gates. Chair of Microsoft. I don't know. Grow some of your language. Good to see you. the DVD version, so it will be much higher quality than that. All right, and that's it. Thank you all for coming. We will see you next week.